My last name, I just stopped correcting people. I know. That's how my life's going. Okay. <laughs> Welcome, John. Thank you. How are you? Doing great. Is everything all right for you? Yeah. Have you had children too recently? <laughs> Not recently. <laughs> <I mean. laughs> Seems to be a trend. In Hi. Good to see you too. I was just so excited to see you. It's been you. seven years for me. We had a good chat. <laughs> Well, you probably remember some. All right, welcome everyone. I'll call the April 20th meeting of the Planning Commission to order. Uh, Tess, can we have a roll call? Commissioner Please. Conway? Uh, Commissioner Conway is absent with notice. Dawson? Absent with notice. Gordon? Here. Um, Maxwell? He's absent with notice as well. Kelby? Present. Paul Hamus? Here. Kennedy? Here. Uh, thank you. Are there any statements of disqualification from planning commissioners on the items on the agenda tonight? Hearing none, let's move on to the approval of minutes of March 16th, 2023. I'm pretty sure three of us were here. Is that enough to approve these, or should we sit on it? We could continue it, too. We should probably continue. Let's continue it, just to make sure we have four. I don't remember the rules on that one. All right, so tonight we have uh, one item of general business. It's a presentation from staff on the sixth cycle housing element. And I'm pretty excited to see this. Thanks for all the good work, and we'll, we'll hear from staff first. Yeah, go for it. Oh, that's my delay on the internet. <coughs> All right, thank you very much, Commissioners. I'm Matthew Renoir. I'm the principal of Planning and Engineering for Kennedy Basin, um, project manager for the housing element this year. I'm actually going to let Inez say a few things. Our uh, consultant, Stephen Horn, is going to be scheduling the meeting and talk to the panel. Great. All right. And Inez is the planning manager for Kennedy Basin Planning and Engineering. Welcome, Inez. We're all going to look at the speakerphone on the DS here uh, when you speak. So thanks for joining us. Perfect. Thank you, Matt. Good evening, planning commissioners, and thank you for, for allowing me to call in tonight. Can you all hear me all right, by the way? Sounds good. Very well. Perfect. All right. So tonight we have an informational presentation to update you on the status and the progress of the housing element update. Um, and then we'll look for, to you for, for feedback and comments following the presentation. And can we go to slide two? So on the agenda tonight, we'll give you a, a quick um, update or summary of the um, housing element background, um, what it entails and what sections are included um, throughout the document. Um, we'll go over the, the, the RENA numbers, the figures, and go through the different strategies for, for addressing this RENA. We'll also go through some of the, the housing goals identified in the, in the elements, some of the updates that we've recently made to it as well. And then we'll go through some community engagement efforts to date, um, opportunities for, for feedback that are currently available to the public, and then go through next steps um, and upcoming meetings. And slide three. So what is a housing element? It is a required chapter of the city's general plan. 
and it is the only chapter to be um, to require certification by the Department of Housing and Community Development, otherwise known as HCD. Um, and this is to make sure that the element is compliant with the many housing state laws. And the element um, is, it, it projects housing needs by, by income categories and identifies um, goals, policies, and programs and objectives to address those needs and guide future housing growth for, for all income levels. Slide four. The, our current draft housing element um, includes two chapters and eight appendices. The first chapter is an introduction. Um, it introduces the, the elements and provides um, a breakdown of some of the requirements for it. Chapter two is, is in some terms, the, the most um, important chapter, the most important section of the document as it establishes the, the policies and the objectives that the city will implement over the next eight years to, to meet its housing goals and address housing needs throughout, throughout the community. Appendix A is a summary of community engagement. It um, includes all the efforts that, that we've done throughout the process and is continuously updated as more meetings and, and outreach is conducted. Appendix B is a review of past performance. And so this looks at the fifth cycle, the current, ho current housing elements. Oh, oh. Sorry, I'm getting some feedback. That was us. We, we, we muted. Oh, no worries. <laughs> All right. So Appendix B, yeah, it's a review of past performance, looking at how the city has accomplished its current programs and, and policies. And it looks to see if, um, if the programs should be continued on to the six, if they were successful, they should be modified um, based on updates to state law, or if they were um, successfully completed or discontinued. Appendix C um, is the housing needs assessment, and so this looks at the city's demographics um, and housing stock and looks for any potential gaps. For example, if, if we identify a, a high senior population um, but low senior housing units, um, then we, will need to, we would need to address that through the, the policy plan. Appendix D, the fair housing assessment, this is the newest requirement for this sixth cycle. Um, it looks for any um, issues with fair housing practices in the city um, and looks to see where um, particular communities are located, if there's any concentrations, any segregation, um, and ways for, for this housing element um, and the sites ident identified to, to address any potential issues there. Appendix E is the housing constraints. We look at a, a number of different constraints through this, this section, um, including non-governmental, which is looking at, for example, the cost of land, construction costs, and other outside constraints that the city doesn't necessarily have control over, but still affect um, housing development. And it also looks at governmental control. So, for example, the, the cost of applications, review times, seeing where the city can um, further facilitate um, and promote housing um, through its, its own processes. We have Appendix F, which is looking at housing resources. So this is particularly relating to special housing needs groups, um, what resources are available to them in the community. So seniors, um, low-income households, persons experiencing homelessness, what resources are, are available for them to, to access shelter and, and, ha and seek and access affordable housing. We have Appendix G, which is um, part of our presentation tonight is the housing sites inventory. And this is the, the section that identifies exact strategies um, and parcels to uh, meet the city's regional housing needs allocation. And then lastly, we have Appendix H, um, which is a, a glossary of, of terms used throughout the document. And slide five, please. So now before we get into the details of what's included in the draft six cycle housing element that's currently available online now, um, we did want to highlight the city's um, 
accomplishments in the fifth cycle. So as you see on the on the table, the city was allocated a total of 747 units to plan for between 2015 and 2023. And the city successfully permitted 1,664 units and met the, the RENA at all income levels. And I'd like to particularly draw your attention to the low and very low income category where the city exceeded its goal at 109% for very low and 367% for low. This is an increase from what we reported during the second community workshop on April 4th. Um, this is due to two projects receiving their building permits on April 13th, and those are 314 Jesse Street, which provided 48 affordable housing units for mentally disabled and formerly homeless households. And um, front, Riverfront at 418 to 428 Front Street, um, which will bring 175 units, including 15 affordable to those making 50% of the area median income and five units affordable to those making 80% of the area median income, plus some ground level commercial space as well. This is a, a significant accomplishment. Uh, accomplishment. There isn't many jurisdictions throughout the state that have met this, um, this fifth cycle arena. So this is something that that the city should be very proud of and um, something that, that we're looking to, to achieve once again during the, the sixth cycle. Uh, can I pause, Slide you, six, please? pause you there before we move to six to just emphasize sure. how awesome that is and like how much work went into that from our staff, our community, the people that sat in this room. This is great. So I just want to acknowledge that we get so upset about we're not doing enough, but this is huge and great. So just wanted to inject that. I'd add, uh, mm -hmm. I'd add appreciation to the commission's work. You know, the, the commission saw many of those projects, and so I appreciate you all volunteering your time to help make that achievement possible. Thank you. And the developers who actually build the building, let me throw that in there while we're appreciating uh, everybody. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, they're a huge partner, and we certainly couldn't do it without them. All right. All right, so for slide six, looking towards the, the sixth cycle, um, we have, the city has received a, a significant increase in units. It is now for, for these next eight years, uh, 3,736 total units um, with a breakdown as you see on the screen. And as we'll go um, through in a, in a number of slides, the city is already um, looking to, to achieve uh, a number of these. Um, through projects that are currently in the in the pipeline. Slide seven. So as part of the housing element updates, the city is required to identify exact sites or parcels that have the capacity to accommodate um, this arena. And in assessing the sites, the city must affirmatively further fair housing. That's that new requirement for this cycle. And this means that the sites particularly ones that can accommodate low income, cannot be located within the same area. Um, they, they must be equitably distributed throughout the community in areas that have close and convenient access to community resources, services, employment opportunities, public transportation, and um, be on sites that have access to utilities as well. So this may result in the sites being um, located in, in a in more concentration in certain areas, but overall it must be um, equitably distributed through, throughout the community. So they, they can't all be located in, um, in one neighborhood, for example. Slide seven, or eight, excuse me. So now to get into the, the strategies, the city is able to account for units gained um, for, for these four, strategies here you see on the screen. And the first is projects in the review pipeline. And so this includes projects that are currently in planning review or that have received approval but have not yet pulled those building permits. The next is projected ADUs. And this is based on the city's past performance since 2018. We're able to take the, the median um, number of units 
permitted since 2018 um, to now and allocate that per year for the next eight years. And so you'll see in a, in a few slides that this, this adds up to, to quite a number of units as the city's made good, good progress in the past few years. The third strategy is sites that are currently zoned for residential and are vacant, and so therefore have that, that ability to accommodate those additional units. And then the fourth is infill opportunity areas. And so we've identified a, a number of different strategies um, where, or a number of different areas where there are sites that, that can accommodate new units with the existing zoning. If we can go to slide nine. So these infill opportunity areas are, include sites in the downtown along five corridors, as you see listed on the screen, four church properties, and then a number of um, sites we're considering in that, that other sites category. The areas identify sites that are either vacant, considered underutilized, um, and so this means that the improvement value is less than the land value or that have developer property owner interest. Our five listed corridors recently underwent rezoning to bring the sites into compliance with what the general plan already permitted, um, which includes higher density residential development as well as mixed use developments. And so we're including the, the capacity from these rezones um, on these sites. We also identified four particular churches throughout the community that have existing zoning permitting residential development and that also have the space available for future development. And the remaining sites in the other category are included following requests from property owners and developers. Slide 10. So now to get into the affordability breakdown of these strategies. Um, I'll preface by saying that these are the same values as those that are included in the staff report. Um, just this table is shown in a, in a different format. And um, the format also may look different than what is included in the public review draft um, as we have one made certain site edits, which we'll go over in the next few slides. And then two, we've or re reorganized the table for um, for clarity purposes, making sure that it's it's a bit more more clear. Um, so to to walk down through the table, um, we see at the top we have our, our six cycle renum, and then um, the first category is pipeline projects. So here we have uh, projects that are being reviewed by by the city, uh, totaling uh, two thousand seven hundred and thirty potential units. And there's an additional, um, a little over a thousand units um, from a few projects that have been approved by the UC Regents on the um, UCSC campus. And so with these pipeline projects alone, the city is able to meet the RENA for the very low, low and above moderate income categories, which alone is, is fantastic. So then we continue making our way through the table um, with what's currently um, permitted through, throughout the city. And so the, the first is those projected ADUs. And so as I was mentioning, the city has, um, is able to, to use its past performance to project out um, that potential development. And so uh, we've assumed a total of 583 units um, to be developed as, as ADUs over the next eight years. For vacant residential land, we have 154 potential units there. Um, we then have um, our five different corridors listed, Mission, Ocean, Mission Street, Ocean Street, SoCal Avenue, and Water Street and River Street. We have our, our church sites listed. We then have uh, different um, sites located in the downtown area. And then we have 1,145 units um, from the downtown expansion plan area. This is currently um, permitted, um, currently zoned, sorry. These are um, units that may be developed currently based on existing zoning. So not 
looking at the expansion plan project. Um, and I'll let Matt talk a little bit about that um, once we, we get through the table. Um, and then we have the other sites, which are, are smaller and, and total only 30, 32 additional units. And so in total here, we have, um, you'll see at the bottom, um, a potential for 8,272 units with the city's current zoning. And I'll, I'll note here that it's, you, you see a, a buffer listed on the, on the very um, bottom row. And it's important for, for the city to include this buffer to make sure that um, we're not hitting a no net loss situation, in which case, um, if sites develop differently than what we've anticipated throughout this housing element, there is a, a buffer to maintain um, the RENA number throughout the, the next eight years. And so HCD recommends typically um, between 15 and 30% buffer. Um, but in this case, through the city's existing zoning, we're able to show that we're largely able to um, to meet these percentages with 67% for the very low and low income category, 33% for moderate, and 208% for above moderate. And Matt, I'll I'll turn it over to you to talk through the uh, the expansion plan and and the the edits that we've made. Yeah, thank you, Vanessa. Yeah, so I just wanted to touch upon again a, a few key changes in the site's inventory that were made since that public review draft came out. If any of you had a chance to look at that already, this does look a little different. Uh, uh, one big change is just in the reorganization of the table and how these areas are counted. And uh, we really found that separating out between pipeline projects and then these projected units uh, was really the best way to prevent any overlap or any double counting of things. Uh, and it very clearly kind of shows, you know, what's what's already in our pipeline and has a, a, a better chance of happening versus something we're just using a projection to, to kind of give an idea of what could happen to, to the state in, in the case. Um, so that, that's one key difference. And then uh, uh, the corridors, we used to have the mixed use, uh, the objective standards mixed use designation uh, on here as a separate uh, category. And we really realized that this was, there was already overlap between that and the corridor projects. So really those projects were just brought into these corridor categories, the, the correct categories that they, they were meant to be in. And there was a few instances where we did have to change the, the densities allowed based on what what they were dropped into the corridor. Uh, they, were, they were supposed to have that corridor density and a little different density than they were. So those were, those were a few of those changes. And then the big one, is the downtown exp uh, expansion plan area. And uh, and that really, in the, in this first draft, this public review draft, you know, what we just, we put 1,200 units in there and we talked about it as a rezoning project. Uh, but really, we, we thought a lot more about it. And uh, HCD doesn't like uncertainty when we submit these things. And it was really, it was a much better way to go about uh, just putting in the exact base capacity of the downtown area and not, we didn't need those extra units and we don't even know what those potential extra units are yet. It's still going through the process. We still need to do CEQA and come up with the exact zoning plan for this area. So there's unknowns there and we can just use the base capacity right now and include that automatically in the site, in, in, in the site's inventory. And we've already done studies uh, through test fits and market analysis to determine what that number of units is, and that's exactly, you know, 1,145. So that's our, our 1,200 in the in the public review draft was just kind of a guess to throw a number in there, uh, and this is an exact number we can provide to HCD in the next uh, plan review and zoning review. So does it include the controversial 20-story building idea at this point? Uh, no, no. This is this is just the the base capacity that someone could cool. do right now, based on our existing zoning. Thanks, Chair Kennedy. Uh, I'll just note um, a couple of things while I've got the floor here. Um, one, um, that um, as Matt noted, we're, we're looking at the downtown plan under current conditions and what could be developed in that area. Um, 
You mentioned the additional stories. The, the current council direction is to have a maximum of 12 stories, and so to work the, um, uh, to, to basically um, provide development standards that will ultimately, including with density bonus, result in 12-story maximum building, maximum building heights. And, um, you know, there are questions about that as we go through the density bonus because we don't always have control over that, but we can um, put uh, our uh, policies in place to um, anticipate that that would be the maximum number of stories. And so that's what we're working towards now. I just wanted to put that out there since a, a greater number of stories was mentioned. Uh, the, the last thing that I will um, mention here is um, in this, um, in the above moderate income category, where we've got the total number of units identified, um, HCD does not allow us to take credit for our inclusionary percentage. And so um, while those are showing as um, above market, we do have the 20% inclusionary that is at 80% of area median income. And so um, those units would actually be falling in the very low and low income. But again, as we've talked about this being a paper exercise and having to follow HCD's recommendations, we've got to have those in the above moderate income, the market rate income category now. But I think that's an important point when we're looking at those um, percentages and where those units fall in compared to what would actually happen on the ground as we develop with our current requirements for inclusionary housing. Thank you for clarifying that. I just brought it up because it was quite controversial. And sure, yeah. I want to be clear, but it's a good reminder that we're looking at current zoning and not the future. So thank you. Uh, Commissioner McCulley. Uh, is that why in the um, in Table G1, the above moderate income is 1,600? Something are, is that including the numbers that you're talking about as far as the units that are inclusionary units? It's 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 quite a bit higher than than the other categories. You, you don't have that in front of you, I guess. But yeah, I, I see what you're you're saying. The the sixteen hundred in terms of our six yes. cycle arena targets. Right. Sure. Do you want to speak to that and the AMBAG process associated yeah. with it, and then I can um, uh, I can amend or update or probably won't need to amend. I can. Uh, <laughs> I'm just chewing enhance. on a lot of these numbers, and it's, I, I love it. It's, a, it's brilliant that there's all this data in here. But Yeah, so, so there was a comprehensive process that we went through with AMBAG that looked at a whole range of factors and then uh, divided up the regional allocations. And Matt participated in that on a regular basis, um, it, monthly at least, and oftentimes more than that. <laughs> and so I'll let him uh, give you a, a brief overview on that. That process for us began in uh, 2021, and at that point, the state had had already done its studies and had given each uh, council of governments, uh, you know, such as AMBAG, our, our that's our council of governments, uh, gave them a number uh, for each of these income categories, and and then it was up to AMBAG to come up with a methodology and working with the jurisdictions that we had. Uh, Coming up with a methodology to divvy up those units for each jurisdiction, uh, so there was there was definitely a lot of back and forth over the next year or so, and then by early 2021 or 2022, uh, at that point they came up with a methodology and, and we received these numbers officially and they submitted it to the state and those numbers were certified. So so those percentages uh, you know, that that came up that came through the units given to them from the state methodology and, and it's based on you know their studies on what's what's needed and so every income category is needed including the above one just one other question and I'm not sure which one of you might want to address it but uh, when you when we talk about the 12 stories kind of following on your question um, are you saying that the 12 stories the base density is lower and you're trying to estimate what the density bonus and the incentives might allow uh, that's kind of how you're getting to the 12 stories or is that is that I'm not sure how you're how that's being integrated our, our current direction from council is, is 1600 units and 12 stories mm -hmm. so we are we are looking at what what fits into that on envelope so you're trying to study the, that the base density of something lower probably and then assuming Correct. there will be incentives okay great and the 
the one thing we're still working out is that 1,600 units includes would include density bonus. That's the direction we've been moving okay. so far. Mm -hmm. So that doesn't uh, it adds a layer of complexity to to what the actual base number is in the bidding system. So it's really up to developers on how much density bonus they want to put in there and what they ask for in the terms of you know, waivers and concessions and things like that to, to fit the design requirements. I'll add. Uh, I was going to say I'll add a little bit to what Matt was um, highlighting about the arena uh, process and uh, so that the regional housing needs determination goes to Association of Monterey Bay Area government when they're dividing that up they're looking at a number of things um, they're looking at number of jobs they're looking at uh, transportation opportunities and public transit opportunities they're looking at risks like wildfire and um, and sea level rise and things of that sort um, and that's, those are uh, key uh, determiners, uh, determining factors, I should say, um, with respect to the overall number. And then they looked at um, two primary factors to determine how the income categories um, were distributed um, amongst those um, total numbers. And um, the uh, primary factors that were considered were um, incomes and, and looking at percentage of uh, population that um, are below um, or lower incomes, um, and then second, uh, racial distribution. And so if a, a city was um, substantially more affluent and uh, more affluent than, than the average and they are whiter than the average, then they would get a higher percentage of the um, lower income categories. Um, Santa Cruz um, was um, pretty close to middle on both and fell slightly above the threshold on one and slightly below the threshold on the other. So ours are kind of middle of the line in terms of the uh, distribution of income uh, among the numbers. Um, some other cities, you know, had their numbers skewed more or less towards um, the the lower incomes or higher incomes, um, depending on those two primary factors. Great. Anything else you'd want to add on that, Matt, or is that summarize it well? Yeah, I'm, oh, that's good. I'm giving up a lot of time here. I'm just okay. Gonna, that's yeah. great. Those are great answers. Thank you. You picked a real uh, technical meeting to join us. So take <laughs> Sorry. Please. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, I just want to add one more thing uh, on the, the site's inventory and, and the sites included in that. Uh, staff report does mention that you know, sites included in this housing element, if they were included in a previous housing element, uh, that triggers uh, an allowance for them to use a ministerial review. Um, so that is something we, we looked at pretty closely. There's actually only four sites total that, that would trigger a ministerial review as, as we currently have in our proposed <coughs> sites inventory. And one of those is a larger site that, we, that allows for affordable housing to be counted towards it in, the, in this process so to speak mm -hmm. um, so that that's something to note and uh, you know given the number of sites that we have that are just uh, that are just for you know go are counted towards the above moderate income you know there there may be some interest from the Commission or council to look at that more closely and consider do we want to add this site in right now and if it doesn't develop and it's added in the next time then it would trigger process so I think I think that is up for uh, consideration still and we may see this you know especially this above moderate income like percentage buffer percentage that's really high right now mm -hmm. that, that that could get lowered next time if, if there's a desire to remove some of those above moderate sites from the inventory Matt and I talked about this earlier I was just reminded by what you just said their strategy like you only get two chances at it and then <laughs> Ministerial review, so I hadn't really understand that understood that subtlety myself, and that was really interesting. And I'm just smiling. Our town is so small; it's so personal. It's like five sites, and we probably all know where they are. So that's just the nature of a small town. But um, do you want input from us on that? It, it doesn't seem like we need we need to. Or if you'd like to provide any mm -hmm. any direction, or you know, just just broadly, if if you think this percent if the percentage of above mod could go down, and that's something that you're okay with. We'd that was like to hear that, and we can, like we can provide that. Yeah. You know, we can definitely. I think by Monday we'll be providing council with 
with an additional memo that speaks to the definition of use. Mm -hmm. So I feel like it's just optics, but when I saw that 208 compared to the 67, I'm like, oh, what? You know, so I think yeah. just on the political public end, it might be nice to think about that a bit more. Yeah, and, and something to remember, too, is that, you know, the, the HCD recommendation for this buffer is uh, is 15 to 30 percent. That's typically it. We're, we're glad that these are a lot higher than that. You know, I think, you know, staying on the good graces of HCD throughout this process as much as possible would be a really good thing and, and help us out a lot in getting this expedited um, with the state. Mm -hmm. It's a significant approval process, but but it is a good point that maybe the recommendation is a little bit higher. And I'd add that we're um, pursuing uh, HCD uh, pro housing designation as a city and that um, can make us eligible for additional points as part of grants. Um, Having the excess buffer does get us points in that pro housing designation scoring as well, and so that's something we'll that we'll be looking below at. that, please. Uh, yeah, yeah there are there are two tiers, and um, at this point we would be um, meeting the upper level tier so that we can get the additional points. And okay. That's something that we we certainly want to maintain. Because I love that we're on the bleeding edge in a lot of these areas. Santa Cruz, we're first for a small city, which is great. That's why I love living here. But this is a long game, you know. It's seven years and seven years, so we want to be calm about it. I mean, is there a specific percentage that would that we could ride that line that met the optics and kept some control, the little bit of control we have at this as a city, and met that goal of getting points? There is. Um, I'd have to go back to the pro housing designation because I can't remember. Matt might remember off the top of his head. If not, I'll venture a guess at what my recollection, at least at what my recollection is. Matt, do you recall? I can pull it up actually. Yeah, if you to, want to, to get the maximum amount of points uh, through that, it's 125 to 150. This is this is written in a different way. This is the percent overall revenue. So yeah. I, I know we're well above 150. Yeah, so, so roughly 50% 50, 50 more, right, is, is how that would essentially, um, and, and so, yeah, so we're well above that, and um, we are going to be revisiting the, um, uh, the overall inventory, particularly for the above moderates, uh, and um, hope to be providing an updated memo to the council in advance of their discussion on um, Tuesday the 25th. Um, so... Um, that's, that is one of the things that we'll be looking at. And if you have any additional feedback related to that, if any of you have any additional feedback related to that, that would be welcome. And um, that is one of the considerations, as you pointed out, Commissioner Nielsen, or excuse me, Gordon, um, <laughs> that, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, uh, that um, it, it can, um, it, result in a loss of local control with respect to the ministerial approach. And sorry to correct myself to that pro housing designation. It's a 125 to 150% for one point category. And then the highest point category is 150% for one point plus two points. Yeah, um, I just had a quick question more specifically about the ADUs. Um, I know that um, in our conversations, I got a lot of good information from staff. Thank you for that. Um, and I was just curious, given that, you know, we're, um, for the housing sites inventory, we have like projected ADUs and sort of the affordability that they're going to be at and sort of a projection there. And that satisfies HCD's concerns, right, around um, a housing sites inventory. I'm curious. Is there a way to count those towards RENA without them being deed restricted or otherwise, you know, have a covenant for affordability? Is there a way to like put out a survey and just say like, this is where the rents are at and count that towards our RENA goals? Or can I guess just explain a little bit of the process around that? Yeah, thank you. So the, the way the, the units that are counted towards our RENA every single year, we, the planning division submits a annual progress report to the state. Uh, on, our, on our arena, and that was actually, that's, well, you'll see the info item right after this actually is, is that item that went to council a few weeks ago. And uh, 
that that's due by April 1st every year. And so we, we submit our progress and that's for the, the previous calendar year. So the 2022 units were included in that report. And as part of that, um, we go back and we go and look through all the ADUs that were built, for instance, I mean, all the units in general, but including ADUs that received building permits. And, and then we actually come up with, a, we can come up with a methodology to present to the state in how we count those units towards their affordability level. Um, so it's ultimately up to us to determine how they're counted and, and that's accepted or not by the state. And, and usually that's in the form of a survey that we do. Um, and then based on that survey, we, we can extrapolate that into various affordability levels and, um, for the state. Um, and so, so that's what we've done in the past. So it's pretty much set that. Uh, and then that, that's, that's one of those things too, they're, they're counted differently in the housing element, sites inventory, than they are towards the actual room count. Because again, this is just showing the state we have the capacity and then the RIMAs, the actual units that we're receiving and, and providing that information to the state. So the state looks at them differently and how they're counted. Great, thank you. Yeah, I was pleased to see those ADU numbers like kind of coming up, given the three rounds we did. And then Quite a bit. So it was nice to see that working. I know this is going to be a really long meeting. <laughs> but um, since we're on this page and we're talking about these percentages and points and we all like to win, um, and we're possibly adjusting some of these, is was there a reason why like SB9 and SB10 aren't included in this as a consideration? Yes. Uh, the city hasn't seen any SB9 development yet and at that I think, I think there, there's one moving through the process right now yeah we've got a couple moving through the process um, but yeah they haven't I, I don't know that there's been any construction yet to the point where they have pulled building permits and you know to make the case with HCD yeah I think it has I to think have precedence we, even like it has there has to be precedence it can't be projection Right. They, they treat it like ADUs, right? Well, so that's kind of why ADUs, I was wondering. They look at the, yeah. the history, and so, you know, to try to make the case. Um, if we really needed the, a, a few more units, you know, I think we could have made the case to HCD that, you know, this is, a, this is fairly new legislation. People are still getting their heads around it. We might see some units uh, in the next eight years, certainly. Um, but for the, for the sake of this exercise, it was easier to keep that projection off. And we do have a policy, I know we've gone through a lot of iterations of policies, but we have a policy regarding SB 10 that is still in there and um, looking at how we can expand opportunities utilizing SB 10 um, and what that what SB 10 is for those that may not be familiar is um, an opportunity to rezone and, and change the general plan and zoning of properties, uh, uh, specified properties um, to allow up to 10 dwelling units and to be exempt from CEQA in making those land use changes. Um, it would, uh, the, the subsequent projects would still be sub subject to CEQA, but just the ability to allow the 10 units on any given parcel um, through general plan and zoning changes would not be subject to CEQA. So there's a policy that um, speaks to looking at how that can be utilized, particularly to expand um, housing opportunities in um, areas that are more affluent or are wider um, so that um, you know we are affirmatively furthering fair housing and um, that's something that hopefully um, we'll be able to accomplish as we um, implement this housing element and, uh, and just while we're talking policy support that policy in particular uh, HCD um, more than ever is really looking for discrete policies that have a timeline and action associated with them. So for this instance with the SB 10, uh, you know, it's not just explore S you know, SB 10, uh, it, it's you know, bring to council options for amendments to the zoning code regarding SB 10 uh, by, this, by this May 3rd. And they're really looking for policy by the chapter. There, there's a lot of kind of more incisive policies like that. Thank you. 
continue the program here? Yeah, did I totally <laughs> derail you guys? Much? Sorry. All right. yeah. okay. It's, we'll it's good to conversation. Staff presentation. It's, uh, <laughs> I want to acknowledge that I blew it and didn't open oral communication, so I'll do that after this item for the public. Sorry about that. But continue. Perfect, perfect item to have these kinds of discussions. So. Good. Um, I'm going to continue just briefly uh, touching upon a few more changes from the public review draft that people may have seen, uh, specifically related to the, the unit changes. Uh, you'll see right here, based on, we, we took a few sites out and added one site in, and, and that actually changed the numbers just slightly to from what you saw previously. Uh, the numbers on the bottom table there are what you saw on the previous table, but I just wanted to call out that they, they changed just slightly based on the project that we added and the, the, or the sites that we added and the sites that we removed. So just quickly, uh, an overview of that. Uh, uh, we have a, the Golf Club Drive sites. Uh, we had originally included those in the public review draft, and uh, it was important for us to remove those uh, largely because the general plan actually calls for an area plan to be done for these sites. And there's a really good opportunity in this area to do a great area plan and, and really do something spectacular to bring housing to this to this site. It's just that, you know, there's uncertainty in the timeline of this area plan and when it'll actually be done. And you know, given that we don't need these units, uh, the general plan calls for this longer process to get units approved here. We felt it important to remove these sites uh, from the inventory at this time and they could be included, you know, if, if the if there's not a project this eight year cycle, you know, this is the kind of site that be, could be included in the next housing element sites inventory uh, and they would likely go through the planning commission in that cycle. And then there's the there's the County of Santa Cruz site. We had had discussions, you know, several years ago with the county and there is interest from them in redeveloping this site with housing. It's just one of those things that, we, again, we don't know when, there's just uncertainty in, in when that'll actually happen. I mean, they're obviously still using it now and there's there, there had been discussions, but there haven't been recently. So uh, even though it's a, it's a great site for housing and we do look forward to redeveloping someday, the, the uncertainty level just necessitated us taking it out for now. That's good progress that they're talking to you all. Uh, and kind of the same with Antonelli Pond site. Uh, again, there you know there's there's been development interest in this site for quite a while. Uh, however, there's also there's been known concerns from uh, the Coastal Commission about development on this site. Uh, and, and development on this site in particular would require a local coastal uh, program amendment. So, uh, going through the Coastal Commission with that amendment and them being there's work to be done still with them on that, and and also there's sensitive species on this site too, so there's a you know environmental process uh, involved in this as well, and, and again those things add up to uncertainty that's just not needed for this site's inventory, so we took those concerns out in particular. And then uh, one thing to mention as well, our uh, public review draft was actually supposed to include the existing library site, and it was accidentally left off. And then we had since had uh, communications with our, our council subcommittee of the, on the housing element. And uh, they preferred that the existing library site stay off the, uh, the site's inventory and actually have the city's lot seven added instead. And so that, that's reflected here that we don't have the existing library site included, but we, but we did switch it for adding lot seven. So th those are the, the changes that were made to the site's inventory since the public review draft. And that's, yeah, that's based on kind of feelings for which one might be going first? Uh, possibly or that what was or, the, you what, know, what did the subcommittee talk about, do you remember? I think it has, yeah, I would say it has to do with the, the politics of the library site yeah. and there's still discussions on how and how best to use that site going forward. I don't think they've decided on housing, you know, for sure. Uh, but I think See. both, I think there's a good chance both sites would, yeah. would be housing. But uh, at this time, they, they decided that lot seven would be better, better fit. 
Thank you. All right, Ines, we're on slide 14. You can take it away again. <laughs> <laughs> Still awake? <laughs> Perfect, thank you. <laughs> All right, so now that we've talked a bit about the sites, we'll move over to the policy plan. And so chapter two um, includes a number of objectives that the city will implement throughout this six cycle. And we don't have enough time, unfortunately, tonight to go through all of them. So instead, we'll just go through the, the seven goals that each of the objectives are, are divided up into. So the first one is to facilitate housing production that meets the present and future housing needs of Santa Cruz residents. Goal number two is to provide an increased and protected supply of housing affordable to extremely low, very low, low, and moderate income households. Goal three is to provide accessible housing and supportive services that provide equal housing opportunities for special needs populations, including the unhoused and those at risk of homelessness. Goal four is to provide increased opportunities for low and moderate income residents to rent or purchase homes. And could we go to slide seven, uh, 15, please? We have goal five, which is to improve housing and neighborhoods throughout Santa Cruz and in designated target areas while protecting residents from displacement. Goal six is the city shall seek to combat housing discrimination and do historic patterns of segregation and lift barriers that restrict access to foster a more inclusive community and help achieve racial equity and fair housing choice. And then lastly, but not least is goal seven, um, which is to fulfill the city's housing needs while promoting an environmentally sustainable, compact community with clearly defined urban boundaries that takes into consideration the existing and potential impacts of sea level rise, climate change, um, particularly on underserved communities. And I'll add here that um, as we reviewed um, with a review of past performance, the city's um, programs, um, some have been distributed and kept throughout this cycle, and then a number of additional programs have been added um, to meet updates to state law um, and to, um, to address the, um, our arena site strategies. And slide 16, please. So as, as Matt was talking about, we had some revisions to, to the site. And we also had a few additions um, to, the, to the policy objectives as well. And so there are four new objectives that you'll see um, in this newer version in comparison to the public review draft. Um, and so we'll, we'll walk through these, these four. The first is objective um, 1.3F, which is to streamline and reduce costs of building plan checks for residential projects of four or fewer units if the building plans have previously been submitted and approved by the city in the same building code um, cycle. We also added objective 3.3 L, which is to work with partner agencies and advocate for expanded homelessness response services within the county and outside the city's jurisdictions, jurisdiction. And this is to um, further facilitate other neighboring communities to, to contribute in, a, in addressing homelessness throughout the, the region. And then slide 17. We have objective 5.5C that's been added to establish a program that promotes the rental protections that are in effect and utilize a variety of means to distribute that information widely with a focus on getting information disseminated in lower income areas. Um, this is as part of our program to affirmatively further fair housing. Um, you'll see AFFH, um, and that's, that's what that stands for. And then lastly, we have objective 6.3C, which is to apply for the AARP age-friendly community designation and assemble a standing committee of city staff to coordinate projects and operations that integrate the age-friendly community program pillars. All right, um, slide 18. 
So since the start of the housing element update process, the city has um, put on a, a number of events and meetings um, and outreach throughout the community um, to really try to get as much engagement as possible. The success of, of the housing element is, is really reliant on having a, a good participation um, and really getting feedback and input from, from the community. So to go through this, um, we had our first informational workshop um, in fall of 2022, where we started to um, engage the community. We had some activities and, and started getting some feedback on um, people's thoughts on, on housing and, and potential needs and, and visions for the future. We had a community survey um, as well that was available online. Um, I think we had also made that available um, on, in hard copy. Uh, particularly for, for tabling at some of the community events that we attended. And so that included the Lower Ocean cleanup events, the Beach Flats cleanup events as well, um, and then the Nueva Vista Community Resources food distribution event. And so as you see actually on the image to your right, um, the, table, the tabling included these um, boards with different stickies to, um, to gather thoughts um, and, a, and, and input on, um, on housing uh, conditions throughout the city. We have also been having some city council housing element subcommittee meetings that, that started off um, this past winter and that are ongoing. We've released the public review draft on March 24th and had a second community workshop on April 4th um, to notify the community of the draft and to walk them through the information that's available in it, as well as some of the, the sites and, and the, the programs as well. And then we're having our, our meeting tonight, and we will be having um, another meeting with City Council next week on the 25th. Slide 19. And so, as I mentioned, um, we have the public review draft that is out. It is available for um, feedback and input until April 24th. Um, we do want to, the community to continue providing us with input past this date, um, and we will continue to gather, to gather that input and collect it. Um, but comments that are included or that are submitted after this date will not be, uh, may not be included in the first submittal draft to HCD. Um, we will continue to gather them afterwards and they will be included in a um, follow-up um, submittal. Um, but for this first draft, if, if comments, um, if, if the community wants comments included in um, the HCD submittal draft, they have to be sent in um, by April 24th. And so we have a feedback form, an online feedback form that's available um, to, to organize comments by section um, on the draft. And we have here this, this QR code for, for anyone um, that, that would like to, to have access to it right now. Thanks, Vanessa. And I, yeah. wanted to, I wanted to add here, uh, I think the staff report says April 23rd. So a April 24th is actually the correct date as the final submission date for, for the comments to be included in the HCD draft. Uh, so I just wanted to put that out there again. Uh, we'll, we'll correct that. All right. um, Glad we're getting an extra day instead of taking yeah, one away. Yeah, Monday. Yep. Uh, and I just wanted to also mention too, we've we've already got a lot of good public feedback uh, since the public review draft has been out. And I forgot to mention this uh, during our sites inventory discussions, but we've already heard back from really engaged, active community members that that are on it and really uh, and noticed we made some mistakes, like in our sites inventory, for instance, like. Uh, a density may have been wrong, or we added units in the wrong location. Like, for instance, uh, 190 West Cliff, uh, that project has 89 units, and they're accidentally all attributed to low income yeah. when, uh, when there's actually 10 low income units and then some moderate income units. So, uh, we, we definitely acknowledge those mistakes, and we, we're really glad people are catching those. And we're going to be going through this all again, too, and making sure uh, that's all buttoned up for the HCD uh, submittal. Last thing we want is HCD to get caught up on little things like that. So glad everyone's catching them, and we really, really appreciate the comments on this that we're receiving so far. Uh, 
And then just one final note on, on possible changes that we'll see as while we're, while we're talking about this as well, um, is that uh, the policies themselves, uh, Ines and her team have been doing uh, many, many housing elements now the past couple years. And after we did the, the policies uh, and submitted them to the public review draft and they're out there, you know, Ines has been really good about saying that you know, that's probably not discreet enough for HCD because we gotta, we gotta dial this in. So another key thing we're gonna be doing over the next couple weeks before that release meets the public is just looking more closely at our policies. We don't intend to, to drop any, but there's definitely gonna be changes in language and, and, uh, and how we approach them and trying to make them as discreet as possible. So those are some other changes you'll even see. Thanks, Ness. Very good, well thanks, staff. That was an excellent presentation. Unless there's other, yeah. oh, we got more? A couple more slides, is that okay? I'm not trying to rush you, excuse okay. me. Thanks, I'll, I'll, I'll Give me like a very <laughs> visible signal when you're done. <laughs> I'll, I'll hand it back to Inez quick for a, a, a summary. <laughs> or not. Well, I guess we lost him. Inez? That's okay, I, I can keep going. Hopefully we can get her back on. Is that all right, or you want to, we can just hang out no, for a minute? No, it's fine. Uh, okay. We just have a few good. slides left. Yeah, sounds really good. Uh, just a quick summary of the community feedback. We included an attachment uh, of, of that feedback into the council report. Um, and I think it was also, it went into the, it went out to you today, so you would have just seen it now. Um, but that those are comments that we reviewed as of yesterday. Uh, just some, just some key highlights on what we've heard so far. You know, facilitate more affordable housing development. Um, you know, there's obviously concerns about uh, water, traffic, parks, parking. You know that we've heard uh, lots of interest in seeking state and federal funding to assist in our uh, housing uh, affordable housing development to address homelessness. Which is great. Um, it's something we're definitely you know, one of our a couple of our policies. Um, considering the design and bulk of potential developments, again something that's important for our down, you know, downtown expansion and, and, and elsewhere. Um, to our objective standards process that we just completed um, last year, you know, that's that's a really you know, key interest of ours in that in that respect. Um, but then uh, exceeding the arena for low and, and, uh, and moderate income, lower and moderate income. possible uh, buildings. And then uh, uh, recommendations for the mobile home, which we will be continuing, um, and then considering effects, the effects of uh, short-term rentals. And then uh, there is interest in upzoning single-family zones to allow multifamily development in the areas that you know, kind of currently have them. Uh, interest in maintaining existing urban character, and then also considering flood and wildfire risk uh, in these elements. And then just some general policies that we talked about this evening too. And then our, uh, we touched on this again, but the tentative project schedule, we have a, a commission meeting today and then we turn it right around with the council meeting next week on Tuesday. And then a couple weeks after that, we look to you know, you know, continue this draft Ninety day review period, and completely depends on the reviewer. But we really hope we have a reviewer that that's engaged with us and giving us feedback throughout that ninety days, so we can start thinking about things and, and working on this stuff in the next few months. Um, but ultimately, you know, get that that full ninety day review and then turning those comments around in August um, for again another submittal that we can see. Round of review. Oh, and prior prior to that submittal too. So we'll start. We'll be uh, uh, we'll be touching base again with the committee, you know, you know, as we're turning around those comments and for, for more feedback on the official HCD submittal deadline.
Can I can I ask a question about the schedule? Yeah, sure. Um, does the um, the council com subcommittee um, follow this all the way through in terms of? I mean, obviously, it's going to council next week, and then do they are they part of reviewing it? Or you submit it, and then they kind of stick with it the whole time through comments because it doesn't come back, right? It's not coming back for to council or planning commission after this. Correct. It okay. will come back to planning commission and city council prior to certification of the document. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so there'll still be yeah. another chance to review it then, and and you know in the interim, you know after that that ninety day HCD review, you know having community workshops and things like that, we'll be certainly open. There'll, there'll be those touch points still, and yeah, the the housing the the council subcommittee on the housing element was was formed earlier this year, and we've probably had about one one meeting a month now at this at this time. Um, so we 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 touch base with them quite a bit, which which has been good, and we'll probably continue um, at a, at about that rate through the rest of the year as well. <coughs> Finally, we have a, our, um, our second submittal to HCD, which will take place in the fall. And again, they, they have a 60-day review at that point, which brings us to November. You know, we're looking at planning commission in, in November and city council in December for certification. So uh, certainly one of those things, I mean, it's, it's far away, but it's already a very tight schedule. So thank you for everyone for in and kind of moving, moving faster with us at this point. Uh, but given those longer HCD reviews, uh, it's, it's really key for us to get to and clean before that certification. And that's why we bring this all the way through. So that, that's it. Thank you very much. All right, finally I can get. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, great presentation. Do we have more questions, or I'd like to hear from the public, and then we'll bring it back for more discussion. Is that good? All right, so we'll now open a public hearing to hear from the public. Thank you for coming in person. We appreciate it. Uh, how many people want to speak roughly? The, just show of hands. All right, well, we can have unlimited time, but I'll cut you off if you ramble on too long. I have unlimited time. Wow. <laughs> Please don't filibuster, John. I won't. I okay. absolutely Thank won't. God. So thanks a lot for uh, hearing me tonight. And I think the city's done a great job on this for the most part. I do have one issue uh, that I think the city's been pretty aggressive and really uh, uh, very cooperative with developers trying to push housing and, and make it happen. Uh, there's a lot of constraints, a lot of obstacles, policy constraints, and economic and other constraints to make this happen, but staff, I think, has been working with us quite a bit to make it happen. Now, I am an owner of one of the properties on the golf, actually three properties in the Golf Club Drive area. So that was on the uh, map. I don't know if it's possible to put that up on the screen, but if not, um, you know, these areas, this 20-acre parcel or area has an area plan requirement, uh, but that area plan says it can go to 20 units per acre when that area plan is done. Uh, area plans can take a lot of different uh, forms. There's no law, legal or state law requirement as to what an area plan has to include. Contrary to specific plans, you know, back in prior to the 2030 general plan, which was done in 2012, uh, the area plan there called for, or the objective for an area plan called for 100 units. Now, I worked for years on that 2030 general plan. That took about, tell me if I'm wrong, but I think it was seven or eight years to go through the process. Right. I probably attended 30, 40 hearings where this issue of Gulf Club Drive development was not the main issue, but certainly was talked about extensively. And the objective is now th over 350 units, or plus 20 units an acre. So 20 units times 20 units an acre, 400 units, you got some land lost and everything else. Density bonus might even be higher. Now, the interesting thing is on page 2.8 of your uh, staff report, this talks about program accomplishments. One of those accomplishments is a planned development project was completed on Golf Club Drive that provided supportive housing for developmentally disabled individuals, including one affordable unit. 
They built 10 homes. Now there's five or six bedrooms in each of those homes. There's 60 bedrooms, roughly, in that project. It's clearly not just for uh, development just of individuals. It's for others as well, and reasonably so. Those other individuals are paying for the cost to house those people. And I have no complaints about this project. We had issues at the time. We worked them out. But my point is, that project was done and fit into the Gulf Coast Drive area without an area plan. Now, maybe it should have had one, but it was done as a PD. Now, that was the reason it was able to be done was because of the historical provisions. And that was an exception that they used. Good for them. That's great. And that was, again, an example of how the housing excuse me, how the uh, planning staff is working with developers to make things happen. So that's, that's good. But I, uh, my point here is that it happened without an area plan. Now, it doesn't mean I'm against an area plan, but it's what kind of area plan. We've, I've owned this property for over 20 years. We've been trying to develop this, work with the property owners. And area plans can be a generalized concept about what can be, go there or can be very detailed and very problematic and cost thousands and thousands of dollars. So I would encourage you to think about, I believe this requirement for an area plan has been a, a um, you use the term in here, a constraint to development, not a facilitation of development. And this is exemplified by this project that got approved, was fit nicely in the, into the whole uh, Gulf Club Drive area in a corner. It doesn't preclude other development. And I would argue that we, we are the, the sole remaining property owners who want to move forward with the project. The other two are somewhat uninvolved. There's heirs. It's very complicated. It's a very uh, kind of a problem to get them going. But um, so uh, I just want to encourage you to not exclude these. In fact, they were included in the first round of this, uh, this uh, report of two of the lots. And I, at that point, I was like, well, I was assumed that it, the others were just a, a accidental omission. There's six total parcels. Two were included. Or were excluded. This time around, there were three included. I'm not sure if it showed up in your report or not. So I thought, okay, well, it got really confusing. Um, I think at one point, uh, the issue is that these, it was considered to be a, a, a appropriate group of properties to include in the housing element. And I don't see why there's any motivation to take it out at this time. I think there's a lot of motivation to include it. So thanks for your time and uh, here for any questions or comments. Thanks. Thank you. Good evening. Um, my name is Ralph Sonnenfeld. Um, I think I know a few of you up here, uh, certainly the staff and um, it's a it's a and uh, uh, Chair Kennedy. Um, uh, I have been involved in um, uh, housing element policy now for a couple years through my day job, um, working uh, uh, with um, stakeholders across the state and ensuring cities have housing compliant housing elements. Um, I work for an organization that has um, filed lawsuits against multiple cities that don't have compliant housing elements. Um, I don't anticipate that we'll be doing that here in Santa Cruz because we have uh, a dedicated staff that is uh, uh, working hard to, to make sure that we do have a compliant housing element. And we already have a pretty good um, uh, uh, zoned capacity in the city. We're not anticipating doing any rezoning. Um, but there are a few things that, that I think we could strengthen um, to, to make sure that, that we um, achieve our, the uh, objectives that the state has for us. Um, uh, the, the two you know, big buckets of, of, well, housing elements are complicated. Um, first, I'll talk about like the stuff on the site inventory, and then I have some recommendations for policies. Um, with regards to our site inventory and our pipeline projects, um, between the the projects that have that are in the pipeline and um, and the university, we are basically expecting to achieve our entire objective, which is pretty cool. Um, but for that to be a reality, we need to make sure that, that it actually happens, right? Um, and um, you know, we, the city doesn't control directly um, what the university does on 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 campus. Um, we don't have land use authority there, um, 
but we we have been able to uh, uh, to stall projects with litigation. Um, I believe the city on multiple occasions has sued the university over uh, over student housing projects and over water issues. And I just really encourage the city to make a firm commitment through the housing element process to um, uh, to not be that barrier, um, uh, to, to promise not to sue the university over, uh, uh, over things that would, that would stop the, the, the planned housing that the university is, is, is com committed to, to um, bringing on campus. Um, in addition to that, uh, the uh, pipeline projects, um, I do have some recommendations that would um, uh, help clarify, like, um, uh, for the public's benefit, uh, where those projects are in the process. Um, it wasn't really clear uh, looking on the site inventory um, for those the <coughs> projects that are, that are listed as pipeline projects, how many of those have already been entitled, um, how many of those ha are, you know, have submitted preliminary applications, full applications. So. Um, seeing uh, you know more specific dates like when the application was filed, when the project was entitled, um, uh, that sort of thing would, would help a lot and um, help make sure that we're not including projects that are uh, basically dead already. Um, I think there, there was at least one project on that list that um, uh, that I believe has had its its uh, entitlements expire, and I just want to make sure that we're not including projects that that are basically already dead and and no longer feasible. Um, but for projects that are still alive that still are in the pipeline, which we want to encourage, um, uh, HCD does typically recommend that cities try to um, facilitate those projects in some way. Um, through streamlining processes. Um, I'm not sure exactly what that could like, look like for, for our city, but um, uh, you know, one of the programs that we're looking at for, um, for small projects is, is streamlining the building permit process. Maybe there is something similar that, that the city could do for, for these pipeline projects or, uh, uh, or you know, maybe even some sort of like ministerial approval process or, or reduced hearing process. I don't know, uh, but uh, the the point is, I, I think we, if if we want to see those projects come to fruition, um, we need to do whatever we can to facilitate um, seeing those projects through to the finish. Um, then, uh, with regards to uh, uh, the rest of the the sites that are on the site inventory. I think it's helpful f for folks to understand that these are already um, sites that allow housing now. We're not proposing to do any rezoning. Um, and and what's being, the sites that are listed essentially are just, it's just a, 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 a record, a public record of what, you know, in an easy to, to reference place of what essentially we can already build on our land with our existing general plan and existing zoning. Um, so when folks see that some particular site is proposed to, or is listed on the site inventory as being redeveloped or, or potentially redeveloped, um, every, every parcel in the city is potentially able to be redeveloped. It's just a matter of whether or not that's feasible. Um, so uh, you know, some cities like Los Angeles have uh, uh, come up with this uh, prob like probability of development analysis, where they have like a formula that they apply, where they look at look at what the zoning is and uh, what the uh, the likelihood of development for similar size projects based on what's available on or what what the the land use on that site is, uh, and they do that across the city, and. Um, and for the city of Los Angeles, they actually realized that they needed to add more zone capacity. Um, we haven't done that analysis. Um, 
So it, it's a little unclear um, if we were relying on our site inventory, what the realistic um, expectation of, of producible units is. Like, um, we, we can see our, our, on our list and we can, uh, on the site inventory, we can see, you know, the expected <coughs> unit number is, say, 30 or whatever. And, uh, but that doesn't necessarily uh, factor in the likelihood that those 30 units are actually going to produce be produced. It just it's like the legal number that they are legally allowed to be produced. So I think maybe a more thoughtful way of, of analyzing the site inventory would be looking at like what the, the likelihood of development of all of these units actually is. And it would give us a more realistic idea of, of what the uh, what the feasible number of of housing units produced being produced in, during the planning period would be. Um, a couple other things I wanted to point out are that uh, there are very few sites on the site inventory now that are uh, city-owned sites on uh, that are uh, service parking lots. There's a lot of community's interest and support for redeveloping our surface parking lots for affordable housing. And it would be, I think, really popular if the city committed to uh, redeveloping um, our city-owned sites in the housing element. Um, so uh, not just listing you know, lot seven or maybe adding lot three and lot six and lot eight and lot 16 and maybe the current library site, um, but also, uh, you know, having date certain, like uh, a, a, a proposal to council or something to uh, uh, to have a plan to re redevelop those sites, I think would be um, moving in the right direction for, for creating affordable housing. The other uh, thing I wanted to mention was um, uh, the density limits on the site inventory. Um, are a number that is larger than uh, uh, than you define in the uh, general plan land use element, and for for most in most cases that's because we don't really have density limits for um, for small units for for um, for uh, one bedrooms and studio apartments and um, SROs or flexible fun, flexible density units. Um, but we do have a density limit for larger family size units. Anything larger than a one bedroom, we do have a limit in our general plan for uh, uh, that limits the, the number of those units that can be built on a, on a parcel. And it, it just seems um, wrong, uncomfortable that, uh, you know, we are facilitating, you know, Smaller units for for students and for uh, and for uh, uh, young people and uh, working folks who who need smaller units, but we're not fac facilitating or incentivizing the way that we are for those units units for families and and we hear repeatedly that for, uh, family sized homes are are a major need here in Santa Cruz. So um, I hope that we we look at. Um, how we can facilitate um, more housing for families. Like maybe, maybe that would include just eliminating the, the density limit overall in the general plan and just using the floor area ratios like we do for the, for the smaller units for, for, for the, um, the family size units also. Um, so but, Rafa, I yeah. really value your comments. I just don't want to keep going on and on. I am sure staff would love to hear all these and work with you. So if you want to just sum it up. Again, yeah. I truly respect your opinion here. Yeah, and that's that's basically about it. Uh, uh, you know, there are lots of advocates who have lots of lots of good ideas. Um, I won't get into some ideas about tenant protections and rental registries and things like that. But but we can follow up with with some email correspondence about yeah. lots of other areas. It's so, a nice open-ended process that's still rolling. So keep plugging in. Um, right. And then I the okay. I, I was just going to say yeah. I. I really appreciate a lot of the kind of needing to sort of 
you're, you're kind of implying a couple of ideas that sound really interesting to me. I'd be happy to correspond with you about it. Mm -hmm. um, some of the process things that are mentioned in the uh, report, I, I would really appreciate uh, maybe a discussion at some point uh, or some correspondence with planning about the process itself for mm -hmm. removing constraints in the process. Mm -hmm. Another big picture thing I wanted to mention real sure. quick is, uh, you know, we uh, we have a lot of zone capacity, um, but we still need to double our rate of production compared to what we have been doing in order to hit our our arena numbers, um, and so we should be thinking about like how we can um, facilitate that increased production um, within the planning period and thinking about programs that, that can help us do that. Um, and uh, and then in terms of affirmatively furthering for housing, there's a lot of uh, of ideas in the in the draft policies that are really good, and we should do all of those things. Um, and I'll I'm here to always continue to advocate for uh, for more apartments in our uh, our low low density neighborhoods. Uh, those are where the highest opportunity are, and um, and apartments are for people of all walks of life. So, uh, more apartments all across the city. Thanks. Thanks for coming. Appreciate it. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to start saying thank you to everyone for what I'm sure are like dozens or hundreds of hours that were put into all of this, uh, the planners and the commissioners. Uh, I wanted to talk about a few things. So first, on this note about ADUs, I would really encourage uh, all of you to go maybe visit some of the ADUs that are open for rent. These are really, really small units. Like the last speaker was just referencing the idea that we need family housing. This is not big enough for a family. It's not going to address families' needs. It's not big enough for a student, really. So while like it's great, any housing is an improvement, um, the focus on ADUs is a bit of a concern. And it feels more like that's an opportunity to just create a new revenue source to extract things from students for landowners than it is a way to really address the housing crisis long term. Uh, with reference to the housing element plan, one thing I saw that I was curious about that maybe the planners can speak to is the extremely low income category. I know that that's not required, I think, in a housing element or at least not included in the RENA numbers. But I did not see any ELI-specific policy recommendations, which struck me as concerning. I did note that the element talks about how the standard practice is to assume that 50% of what you're given as very low income from ARENA will be ELI. But the numbers given, or the data given within the housing element show that very low, extremely low income renters outnumber very low income renters by a factor of two to one. So if the planning documents are assuming that we need just half of these very low income units to specifically be extremely low income, it seems like we're not adequately planning for the actual demand of extremely low income renters. So I was curious if maybe somebody could speak to that and speak to some specific policies that might encourage rent or the production of rental units for extremely low income renters specifically. Uh, with respect to preservation, I was excited to see a right of first refusal recommendation including in the housing element. I'm curious whether there's any other recommendations that would make that right of first refusal more meaningful by allocating funding specifically to allow the acquisition of those properties. Because it's great if you can buy the property to have first call or first dibs on that property, but it's only meaningful if you can actually afford to acquire that property. And I'm not sure that the city is in a place where, whether it's the city or it's the groups that the city might partner with, we're actually able to acquire and preserve that affordable housing. I was concerned by the section about protections and wanted to maybe encourage the Planning Commission to consider that. Uh, one of the goals under protections was, uh, I think, 
4.1, it aims to assist at least 50 renters with rental assistance covering last month's rent and uh, the security deposit, that was it. That seems like a really underwhelming goal, like 50 people is not a lot during the entire housing cycle. It seems like we could be doing more and 6.1 seeks to improve the use of housing choice vouchers. But one thing I was curious about is how many of those vouchers are already going unused as we speak. I know that in the state of California, a substantial share of vouchers go unused because people cannot find the housing. So increasing efforts to provide housing choice vouchers doesn't seem like a meaningful solution if we don't have a place to use those vouchers. And another thing I didn't see there and that you might know if you're a renter or if you're seeking rent is that there continue to be quite a few rental listings where illegally there is a statement that they will not accept Section 8 vouchers or housing choice vouchers, which is not allowed in California law is my understanding, but continues to be a problem, at least in my experience looking for rent rental units in the city of Santa Cruz. So I'm curious whether you know that's been explored and whether there are policy recommendations that can improve enforcement of uh, source of income discrimination laws. Uh, this is more of a question, but I was curious about supportive housing specifically and whether there's an attempt to measure and address the specific needs for supportive housing. Uh, it doesn't seem like Rena provides that, but I would be curious. I saw it mentioned in the housing element, but not with any specificity. And finally, I wanted to talk about the community feedback and the portions regarding renter protection. So I know we're past most of the community feedback portion of the housing element, but I did want to express some concern. It seems like an incredibly small and non-representative sample. Somehow renters constitute only 40% of the respondents, when an accurate sample of Santa Cruz would be well above 50% renters. So I would encourage, you know, if there's anything that could be said or done for future housing elements and future cycles, to really try to increase engagement with the community and create a more representative sample. Uh, and then I was surprised, I did see quite a few comments about the need for rent control, provisions that would protect renters, just cause evictions that are listed in the housing element but didn't show up on the slides today. Uh, I saw that there were calls for, for instance, like a, there's a graph, it shows exactly what people were saying they most needed. ADUs are like half the level of things like just having more multifamily housing and affordable housing generally. So it feels like the focus uh, that we're hearing or that I heard today is maybe not the same as the focus of the actual community feedback. Uh, and regardless of the community feedback, it's great that we are building more affordable housing and that we have this stuff down the pipeline. It will be years until a lot of that housing is available. Those of us who are renting, we need some kind of protection right now because housing that's affordable five years from now or two years from now doesn't make a difference for me or anyone else who needs affordable housing today when we get up tomorrow. And so every day until that housing becomes available is another day when we're forced to make hard choices about what we can afford and which necessities we will go without. And it is another day in which we are at risk of being unable to stay in Santa Cruz. So I would just really encourage the consideration of some more explicit policies regarding renter protection and tenant protection. Thank you very much for your time. Those are great comments. You're not required to, but what's your name? My name is Julian. Hey, nice to meet you. Thank you. Thank I appreciate you. hearing your voice. It's not often heard in these chambers. So. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, and then staff's available and you know can follow up on all those. Good. Would anyone else in the public like to speak on this item? Seeing none, thanks everyone for coming out. We'll bring it back to the commission for some more discussion unless staff would like to rebut anything or, or respond. Or we can do that later too. I'll respond to a few things. Cool. Um, I first um, wanted to um, thank the members of the public for speaking. There's some really great things that um, were identified and um, some things that will certainly be um, 
taking into consideration as we're both making recommendations to the council and then putting um, out with our drafts to um, Housing and Community Development, the State Department of Housing and Community Development in um, early next month. Um, there were a few things um, I, I just want to speak to. Um, Rafa uh, commented on um, you know, the ability of, of projects of sites to develop as they are now. And um, if a site is not included on the inventory, then that also doesn't preclude it from developing as housing. And I just want to be clear about that, um, that if a, a general plan designation and zoning, just a general plan designation under our current <laughs> state laws, allows for housing development, then um, whether it's on the inventory or not, it has the ability to um, proceed. And, and there are some instances where there are things that need to be done in advance of that, um, like uh, an area plan in, in some instances um, for a couple of the site areas that we um, were talking about. Um, uh, with respect to ADUs, you know, they are an important um, component of how we proceed um, with um, uh, increasing the number of units, particularly in um, high opportunity areas. Um, I, I do think it's important to point out that um, you know, relative to the other numbers in here, um, they are a, a relatively small uh, percentage, uh, yet they're important in, in the, that they can integrate um, individuals into those high resource areas. And so um, they're one component. They're not uh, the only component by any stretch. Um, there were some, some questions about um, uh, extremely low income and um, uh, about uh, supportive housing. And um, one of the things that we as a city have been very successful at is um, both um, streamlining and facilitating supportive housing projects um, and um, working with and through our economic development and housing department actually producing those units and, and that's a big reason why we've met our arena targets for this last cycle so um, it's as far as the streamlining goes um, we've utilized AB um, 2162, um, which allows for 100% affordable housing projects that have a 25% supportive housing component for individuals with disabilities or those experiencing or at risk of homelessness to proceed through a ministerial process, meaning they don't have a discretionary review. Their project, their process typically is just um, uh, confirming that they meet all of the objective standards. Um, that is um, sometimes done through a design permit process, but not through a public hearing, but one that um, would allow them to essentially um, not have to go through CEQA and um, to have a much higher level of certainty and a faster process. The state requires that that's done for projects of 50 or fewer units. We have brought information to the council and the council has supported the facilitation of these types of projects on a number of instances and that has gotten us the Jesse Street project that was um, referred to earlier by Inez um, that helped us achieve our RENA targets in every income category this past uh, week or so. And then also um, we had uh, Pacific Station South that uh, the city is constructing 70 affordable housing units there, plus uh, space for Dientes and Community Health Foundation. We've got um, Pacific Station North where that's done. The Center Cedar Project, the private project with 65 affordable units next to the Red Church, the Calvary Church, that utilized that. So we're really looking at ways to facilitate that, um, that the production of those supportive housing units. And when we're going for those, and, and, talking, and talking about the production there, when we're going for those tax credits, those are often also requiring or looking at, at getting additional points for targeting those extremely low income. And so that is an important component. We've got other projects that are looking at that as well with the 120 permanent supportive housing units that are going in at uh, Coral Street. And so that is an important component. And I think it, it's a fair um, comment to say, let's look at how we can also um, 
make sure that we're, we're not forgetting that ELI component and, and having that um, lost in the, the VLI. Um, the commenter's correct. The, the, uh, the RENA numbers that we look at don't segregate out the extremely low income and the very low income. So on um, our annual reporting, which we'll, you'll hear as your next item, that isn't distinguished. And um, that doesn't mean that it's not an important component. And so um, I, I appreciate the comments from the, uh, the commenter there. And one, one more point on that too. There's, so uh, I think what Lee was getting at as well is that, that supportive housing, which we do talk about a lot in, the, in our policies and in the housing element, uh, does count towards extremely low. Uh, we just we don't explicitly say extremely low, so I think it's a really good point that you know we might want to we might want to say that explicitly somewhere in the policies to to mention that and um, and a, a few other points. Uh, so the state in our next annual progress report does actually will will now require cities to report on extremely low. It won't. Uh, it'll still be counted towards the very low units, but I think the state is getting more interested how many of those extremely low units are being produced. And so they're gonna start collecting data on that starting in next year's uh, annual progress reports, which I think is exciting. And it kind of coincides with uh, AB 2011, which uh, just passed last year and, uh, and uh, went into effect on January 1st. This is the bill that uh, if, a, if a project meets certain affordability requirements, it's allowed to uh, develop residential on a commercial property. And one of those residential requirements is actually extremely low. And so the state is looking more seriously at, at figuring out ways to uh, specifically add extremely low income projects or extremely low income units to projects. And yeah, it's, it's definitely worth noting in the housing element that those things are coming through. Sure. I think one other final thing that I'd add, there was a comment from Rafa regarding the, um, the promotion of um, not just small units, but also larger units. And um, uh, that is something that I think we, we should look at. I mean, there, there have been a lot of uh, things that have helped us to, uh, a lot of policy changes and code changes, I would say, that have helped us um, uh, move towards promoting smaller units and looking how we can do that for larger units, I think is also important. Um, I think uh, an important thing to note there is that um, while um, some of those smaller units like SROs, uh, single room occupancy or flexible density units don't have that density limitation um, and we allow for higher um, uh, density for studios and one bedrooms as well, um, the dwelling units per acre um, is typically not applied. Um, so that general plan limitation typically isn't applied because we're, we're typically seeing mixed use developments and then the floor area ratio becomes the limiting factor. And I think um, one of the benefits of that is that um, if um, there isn't a limit on the number of units, that um, developers who are seeking to do the two and three bedroom units because you know, the, the developers do look at the market as they're proceeding and they can see the pipeline projects that we have which do include a fair number of smaller units. And so we've actually been getting some developers kind of kicking the tires and saying, hey, we're seeing the pipeline and want to see these larger units. Um, but I think that um, what we will likely see um, and We'll see how this plays out. But I expect some of those two and three bedroom units will be smaller two three and three bedroom units because it'll be limited by the floor area ratio. And so those smaller two and three bedroom units, they can get more of them if they're smaller versus having um, you know, the larger two and three bedroom, which they would have fewer of. So I think that's one of the trends that we'll be seeing that it's one shaped by the market, but the, the comment is uh, a valid one that you know, it's really all uh, unit um, types that we need to make sure that we're we're facilitating, and I think um, the parking changes are one of the ways that that is also going to help because um, we've we've been changing our own codes, um, and the state has also stepped in with uh, AB two hundred nine seven that has, that 
your commission saw recently and um, that the council is considering as well. And that's limiting the ability for the city to require parking. And, and um, so that's gonna also, I think, help facilitate some of those larger units. Awesome, I'm glad to hear some two and three bedrooms are coming. There's been a lot of SROs. All right, so now's the time where we take a deep breath and then bring it back to the commission. It's not even nine o'clock, you know, we're doing okay. But um, uh, we're just giving advice to staff, so we can do a motion if we want, or we could just talk and these guys can take notes. What do you all wanna do, just an open discussion or? I have a couple of comments, but sure. however you wanna go at it. Okay, well let's <coughs> dive into comments and if someone's moved, make a motion, we can, we can do um, that. Mr. Sonnenfeld's comment, housing elements are complicated. Yes. Um, between you, the city and UCSC, um, all the arena requirements are currently projected to be covered, which is a great result. I think everyone, I'm, I can't, I hadn't, I, this was a surprise to me when I saw these numbers coming. I can't believe it, it's wonderful. But um, I think that, you know, I think the thing that's not, being discussed in there, there's some policy uh, statement in the element regarding removing barriers and, and barriers, in my view, I've been here many years, the barriers are, are often outside of the process of the, um, the actual regulations, the rules. It's often what comes kind of as part of the discretionary uh, process, and that is that work for many, many <laughs> months, years with staff to develop a project according to the regulations and to get a positive, you know, a, a staff report recommending approval. And then uh, the wheels come off when, when you get to a public hearing. And I've often wondered if there's some way that in, uh, I don't have the number in front of me, but one of the elements was, um, one of the element policy suggestions was about the, approval process, and I wondered if if there's some way that in the discretionary process a positive staff report uh, uh, recommending approval could be treated as a, uh, a presumptive approval and the bar for turning it back after that could be raised a little bit just because, just as you have to do with a um, with a, when you're asking for a variance, you have to, there are very specific findings that have to be made. And they're not just kind of um, uh, anecdotal or you know that kind of thing. So that's one thing that would address some of what I think Mr. Sonnenfeld was saying and uh, what this, what this uh, policy element uh, mentioned. Um, I'll just address one other thing that, that Julian said. Um, the AD regula regulations, when you talk about unit size, as you were addressing just now, the state level allows multi, you know, family-sized units to be built. I mean, they're, they're, I've done a lot of affordable housing according to HUD standards, and if you're doing 800 square feet in, in, in HUD money, that's a lot of, built, that's a lot of bedrooms. <laughs> and, um, uh, that doesn't mean that the property owners are going to decide to build that. And so I think that, I don't think any, I, well, I don't know, maybe people want to get into mandating minimums rather than maximums, but I think that that's a, a, a big part of, the, of the, the drag on it is that, you know, someone has to propose it, pay for it, build it, and um, that's really kind of up to the market and the, and the, the property owners. That's my riff on a couple of points, but. Good comments, I like yeah. it. <laughs> Anybody wanna go next? Sure. All right, Commissioner Paul Amos. Okay, thank you to staff for that good report. Um, I'll just start by saying that, you know, meeting RENA goals, I, I don't know, I'm a little bit newer to the senior, I, I don't know if the city's ever done that. So meeting, you know, the fifth cycle goals, that's huge. I mean, um, it's quite an accomplishment. So, I, and I think that our planning staff has a lot to do with that, so. Um, that's a huge win. Um, you know, the sixth cycle, it's going to be a heavy pull. 
And, um, you know, with the number of units that we have, I think that we're going to need as many things in our tool belt or tool belt to uh, accomplish this as possible. And um, that's one of the reasons that I really love the emphasis on the ADU, J, J ADU uh, production that is like gradually increasing. Um, you know, in my discussions with, with staff, there's probably a number of reasons for that. But I think that this is a really good focus um, for a lot of reasons. But one of the best reasons, I think, is that, you know, SB9 projects are not panning out quite as much as originally thought. And so we have a lot of um, developable, developable, developable land, sorry, um, in high opportunity areas that are largely demographically homogenous, right? And so if we're looking to further uh, fair housing in these areas, I think that the development of smaller units in people's, you know, large backyards is not a bad way to go. Um, and, you know, aside from that, I think that, you know, smaller units like this wall, um, I do recognize the need for family size units. That is a great need. Um, I think we're all well, uh, you know, well aware of the realities when it comes to the housing situation in single family rentals. Like, for example, when I was in college, like, you know, 15, 20 years ago, we were packing, you know, 10, 12 people into a four bedroom house. And I think that that's, you know, somewhat the situation here when it comes to uh, single family rentals on the west side, especially, you know, closer to UCSE. And so to relieve some of the pressure on that overcrowding, I think that, you know, some of the smaller units are serving a purpose there. And ADUs, JADUs, things like that can can serve that purpose. Um, so I would just encourage um, breaking down barriers as much as possible for that. Um, you know, uh, like for example, I know that the state has removed uh, owner -occup occupancy requirements temporarily. And it seems to me that, you know, given the ADUs are continuing to enjoy a, a pretty high degree or at least an increased degree of applications, I think it's probably likely that the state might adjust that, um, if not in perpetuity, then to kind of extend that. So um, maybe there's a way to include that with uh, existing property owners or maybe once uh, uh, a property changes hands or something like that. I know that there's some deed restrictions on um, owner occupancy requirements for those types of building projects, but maybe there's a way to tweak that so people don't get left holding the bag once they do develop an ADU. Um, I do think also uh, potentially revisiting the incentive program um, for landowners to deed restrict their ADUs might be worth a, a good shot. Um, you know, in, in my understanding, it can take a good while to, uh, to pay off an ADU to, to break even. And, you know, that is probably even more true today with rising construction costs, with increased interest rates. Um, Capital is just more expensive. You know, it's more expensive to put these units up. And so um, maybe creating a little bit more of a streamlined process around that somehow. I did learn that um, by waiving ADU fees under the current program, that what that does is it triggers prevailing wage. And so whatever, or at least that's my understanding, um, whatever savings you are getting from the waiving of fees, you're getting hit with prevailing wages. And I'm not against prevailing wages, I'm absolutely for them, but just in terms of creating an incentive for landowners to provide housing units and to make major investments in their own property, um, there, there may be a way to tweak that somehow. Um, I don't have any good solutions to that, but um, just, just wanted to make that comment. And then um, last but not least, uh, just continue breaking down barriers for uh, Section 8 voucher holders. I completely agree that the, uh, the amount of people that have vouchers versus the amount of properties that will take them, um, there, there's a big disconnect there. And so um, my understanding is there is a somewhat of a marketing program through the county um, that provides funding for lost rent or damages or things like this to kind of alleviate this idea that sort of equates um, rental subsidy with undesirable tenant behavior. So, you know, I, I think that's a false narrative myself, and I think that the Section 8 program is a, uh, a no-brainer for people that are looking to, to collect market rate rent that's guaranteed by the government. So um, I would just, that would be my comment on that, just to, you know, continue marketing that and continue finding a way to reach uh, homeowners to kind of increase the <laughs> likelihood that they'll they'll take those. So um, I think that's pretty much it. Thank you, guys. All right, good comments. <clears throat> Commissioner Gordon. Okay. Thank you. This, I know, is a huge amount of work and so, um, and a lot of pressure and timing and all those things, so thank you. Um, I'm gonna just mention something about the SB9 and, and removing barriers because 
um, we just kind of unearthed um, that if you build more than one unit, then it, it, like you know you can do two duplexes on an SB nine, um, but if you build more than one unit, then the other one has to be affordable. So that's fifty percent, which isn't really required on any other development. And so that could be part of what we're seeing as a barrier. Um, so we're still trying to get some answers on, on specifically, and there's apparently in lieu fees that you can pay, but you know, it's not, it's already hard enough for it to pencil. And some of these properties are more unicorns, you know, like not every property fits that, but there are definitely some um, local barriers that um, we're running into in regards to SB9 that maybe we should look at a little bit more closely if we want to utilize that, um, particularly in properties that could utilize it closer to UCSC. So um, then a couple of other things that are more like optics, because you know we sort of started to talk about that a little bit about percentages um, in, um, um, you know, income level percentages. And I think um, it actually came up in another planning commission meeting um, in regards to the front and um, water street development um, about transparency. You know, that we, I, I think, well, particularly here, everybody that I'm sitting next to really does, you know, support housing and we also want a diverse community. Um, but we also like, I think, value transparency. And as we're sitting up here and community members that we have to, you know, communicate with about passing some of these projects. And so the, the narrative that we hear a lot is it doesn't pencil. And, um, and it, it, you know, if we add too many affordable housings or units and, um, you know, we are using the base density, you know, for affordable housing units um, and and not requiring them above that. And I feel like um, one of the things that came up is being able to see those numbers. You know, I know that it would be very difficult to analyze them, but from an optics standpoint, I wonder if there's the possibility of finding a way where we can actually have that be something that we look at, you know, that, that is, because there are a lot of things that I hear from the community of like, well, we're streamlining this and we're doing all these things, we're removing a lot of barriers and that, those are intangible costs to developers and so shouldn't we, you know, require that they actually hit 20% after bonus versus the, what pencils out to be closer to 13 is what we've been seeing. And so I guess I'm just bringing that to you because I hear that a lot. And so if there was some way optically that we can show the community that we're, you know, that we are trying to support the developers and also, you know, and I don't know how we can do that. I mean, I've been thinking about it and we can keep talking about it, but it does keep coming up. And so if there's a way that we can be transparent because we don't really see those things. Um, I know you can move numbers and all those things, but there may be a way. And then um, with that, I think um, just optically, you know, as we're talking about um, some of these developments and possibly displacing people, that's something that's come up, you know, quite a bit in a lot of the public comment. And, um, you know, if there was, you know, I mean, I know we could subcommittee things to death, but some, way that we could, you know, analyze the, the real outcome, you know, versus just have having sort of performative things that we list that we'll do. Is there something that we can actively do when a development comes into play that may have a significant impact if there's something that we could, um, you know, some process or subcommittee that we could check in with just again optically from the community standpoint, like that we're looking at that aspect as well as meeting Rena numbers and you know all the other things that we're trying to do. So I don't know if I made myself clear, but those are a couple thoughts. So thanks. No, that made sense to me. Those are good thoughts. 
Uh, Tess, are you ready to put that link up for me pretty soon? So I've got a couple comments, uh, three little quick ones, and then kind of one more extensive one. Um, I'm thinking back to 2016, where if I remember right, we built one affordable unit. That was my saddest planning commission meeting. Like, I cried that night, and that sucked. So it makes me so happy to see all this growth um, since then. There were a lot of things that went into that. It's a long story, but right on. This is great. Um, I want to salute the public outreach process. Like, I really read through that entire section, and it's just so interesting because all of my assumptions about that neighborhood or this neighborhood, when you read what people say, it, like, they're all wrong. So I just want to recognize how hard it is to get input from everybody. And what I saw was a really rich process and working with different communities at their level with different styles. So uh, thank you for doing that. I know that it's hard. And I just, as long as we're continually improving that, I'm happy. Um, yes, yeah, so then I get to the big thing, and I put up the city council district map. I love this mapping. There's a whole section of the report there, right, where it goes through, like, income inequality, to do this one after the other. And I'm pretty visual myself, and I just love how these maps put the inequality right in front of us. So I just wanted to kind of throw up some ideas that are big ideas, see what other commissioners think, and then see if we want to recommend something to council or not. Um, so I want to see this RENA data on this map, and here's why. Because this map is a less, ra less racist and more equitable way to organize our city council. You know, that's what we learned when we were sued and then pushed all these little pieces around. And that's fantastic. We should just put that straight into zoning. I mean, I know we are, but let's do it more directly. Um, because as we know, zoning is by conception and application racist, in my opinion. You know, Berkeley researched this. It's true. So we need to think every minute about correcting that up here. <clears throat> and I think this might be a fun and interesting way to look at the data that might help that goal. Uh, because each of these districts is more diverse, you know, economically, racially in all different ways. So then I don't think this is about council politics. I think this idea would be about the citizens, my you know fellow people who live in this town. I'm in District 3 right there. And you know, we are the ones who are accountable for producing enough housing in our district for my mom when she needs it, the kindergarten teacher of my son who left after one year because she couldn't get a place and was driving from Marina every day, you know. So I think it would focus the citizens on these goals, um, whether they're met or not. Um, it would make the decisions local. And as a joke, you know, everything is about being local in this town, right? So it would make it more local. It's so easy to say, I don't care about what happens on the other side of town. And you could reduce that even further to focus everybody onto it. And then finally, and obviously politically, it would make our mayor and the council members really accountable for their share. And it'll be really clear who is or is not doing their part, you know, after the end of this cycle. So I don't know. There's some downsides. We don't want to be specific. You know, we don't want to be pointing Pete's house is going to be developed at because that's weird. But I just want to pitch this thought and get some feedback and uh, see if this is something we could talk about recommending the council. So are, are you talking about like equally spreading the RENA goals across the districts or? No, that's a great one. And we had an email exchange about this, not equally, equitably, right? And I don't know what that means. We'd have to figure that out here. I was going to say, can you, okay, yeah, I was going to. My premise is that the redistricting <laughs> kind of started that a bit, you know? But I hear you, like I thought it would all be figured out and what's equal and I don't know. I mean, well, there's this like, east side west side thing oh the west side's not doing enough ucs is not doing enough no no we need to all do it you know so conceptually i think it's interesting mm -hmm. i mean i would look to you to i mean <laughs> district two has i mean there are districts that have more opportunity than others so I, i'm wondering about that because there's like a whole rezoning thing that would need to potentially be addressed in that, but also, I mean, I think, right? I mean, like District 2, for instance, is 
got a, just a much more opportunity for multi-residential housing and, um, you know, I guess three and six might have more SB9 opportunities, but there's barriers and there's no barriers in District 2. So how would we, how would that play out? It's a good point. I mean, I was thinking driving down about when you do like fundraising and you make that big thermometer and it's gray and then you like start painting it. Back in the day, we did it with paper, you know? <laughs> but that's all it would be. You know, here's, here's how much you could do. And I hear you and like those are all good next steps, but my thought was just like bring what's here to the surface. Got it. And so it's like where I can show it to my neighbor. Got it. Hey, here's what we need. So it's optics. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Got it. Mm -hmm. And as far as SB9 goes, I think <clears throat> three and six have a lot of the smaller parcels in town. So it, it, I think on average it would be less likely there that for SB9 to be proposed there. Um, and it would be more likely maybe where I live in one or uh, obviously two with, you know, the, 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 uh, M, the um, medium density and the, den the uh, multi-unit low density zones that are already there. Um, maybe four, but um, there, I definitely think that the way that the parcels exist now probably lends some more, more to others. I'm reflecting back on the corridor process, and mm -hmm. like, you know, two's mm -hmm. kind of like got two corridors. It's just the geography. Yep, I live Sorry, right, folks. Mm -hmm. I live right around the corner from eight three one, and I'm all for it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, the The idea of the uh, in the I think in the element it does talk about it does it gives remarkable mapping of demographics of income of uh, housing. Uh, people that feel at, at 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 risk with their housing. Um, some of the some of it was surprising to me, but I think that it really does show that there's a both an ethnic and a, uh, an income distribution that you know uh, can help inform the way that we target things. Uh, I think that's what we were saying before. The recommendations in the element. Yeah, but I think it's an interesting idea. I'd be interested in hearing more. I'm, I'm not sure if uh, how to go about doing that. Um, could you know direct staff to return with a report on what equitable right. distribution of housing across the districts would potentially look like? Maybe what some options would be. We could do something like that. I think there's a lot to a lot more to know before mm -hmm. you know committing to any type of, of plan on that. I, I, I love the intention. Mm -hmm. I just, um, you know, the specifics I think are, would be really important here because yeah, there are major constraints um, and, and differences in between the districts in terms of um, what's possible. Um, I think it would be interesting to contrast that map with the zoning map only because if you're talking about something like SB9, it's like carpet bombed R1 everywhere on the map. And that is that is every district, mm -hmm. right. and so you kind of think that it could be applied if people chose to do it. it goes back to the point I made earlier about people might not choose to build large ADUs, but mm -hmm. well, I don't know. I, I hear you, but I, I feel like that's a bit more restrictive. And like we've had the conversation, I wouldn't certainly wouldn't want to slow things down by bringing this back. And we already have a council subcommittee and council, so uh, you you guys want to respond or yeah. what do you think of this idea? <laughs> yeah, thank you. So first of all, it, it's something we are working on, and if we get into the state scale, certainly it is an overlay of everything that's you know based on the county districts. Sweet. Um, so that will be in the submittal, uh, depending on if there's changes to the site's inventory in the next couple of days before council. Um, We'll see how long that kind of takes us to to rework the numbers um, and figure that out. But it's going to be something that'll be in our our submittal. Um, and uh, kind of the points I, I raised earlier, Commissioner, um, mm -hmm. 
I, I think one one tricky thing with this, there, I, I think your intent's really good, and there's definitely an a, AFFH, uh, you know, permanently furthering fair housing component to, to that idea, and and to have a, a, distrib a distribution of units throughout the city uh, is, you know, and especially in higher resource areas is really important. Um, and it's really the housing element in the site's inventory becomes, you know, quite a balancing act in that regard. Uh, you look at like our downtown, you know, technically based on based on uh, demographic data, that's not a highest resource area in the community. Like the west side, for instance, mm -hmm. would be a higher resource mm -hmm. area. Um, but when you're when you're thinking about highest and best place to develop, the most sustainable place to develop, that's still going to be downtown. You know, it's more transit rich, it's more amenity rich, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's more service rich. Uh, so that balancing act is, is really tricky, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. I think you're, you're uh, you know, in addition to just the zoning map, that's naturally going to pull more units. These, these nodes of activity, you know, the corridors and the downtown uh, will attract more development. And, and that, that falls outside of the council map. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's pretty tough to figure, to exactly distribute that. Yeah, sure, but, I, sure. but I think the, in, the intent's definitely a good one. Okay. Am I the only one who goes on the Reno scoreboard? You know, I, I like looking to see how Huntington Beach is doing and stuff. They're not doing well. Um, all right, well, thanks for the feedback. I am all right with, like, just passing this all around. <laughs> is that all right with everybody? I think it also might be interesting to also focus maybe on, like, the top five census tracks that are you know, the most homogenous or the most, mm -hmm. you know, affluent or something like that too. That could be a good way to do it. Um, so I'm sure there, well, I don't know. That'd be interesting, I don't know. Yeah, it's a, there's a uh, I want more information. There. It's an interesting prospect. Okay. Well, thanks for listening. That's, that's uh, I just think about those citywide things and how important our work is. Um, good, well, um, I'm missing our other three commissioners, too, as we receive input. I know everyone can't make every meeting, but um, great. So, staff, I think that's the input you need. Any other questions for us or more direction needed? No questions or direction. I think I'd just wrap this up by reiterating this is, uh, first off, thank you all. It's great feedback from the commission and from the community. Um, really appreciate the participation and um, depth of the conversation. Um, I wanted to remind everyone that we are doing a very quick turnaround on this and we're going to the city council this coming Tuesday, the 25th. And um, our, our goal is to um, summarize uh, a lot of what we've heard here tonight and um, get that to the council. Um, we have a, a meeting with the council subcommittee tomorrow and so we're we're targeting um, taking feedback from that as well as the feedback we've heard tonight and getting a, a supplemental memo out to the council so that the full council um, can consider the comments that have been heard. Um, so we'll plan on getting that out on Monday and <laughs> then we will be- And all of our other comments now, between yes. now and then. Yeah. Exactly. When do you we, guys sleep? I mean, I guess <laughs> kids, it probably doesn't anyway. <laughs> So uh, thank you, and and yes, uh, we we are still accepting comments, and even after the um, the this comment period, Ines commented that you know we might not be able to consider those comments as part of our first resubmittal, uh, as our first submittal to HCD, and you know we will try to even you know consider whatever we get up to that time, but you know there's a point where like we've got to put a bow on it and send it away, um, but that doesn't mean that we're not um, continuing to accept comments. So we encourage. Um, the members of the audience and those listening online and, and your friends and family members to all take a look at this. This is a, a really important document and um, to the extent that we're gathering that additional feedback, it's just gonna make it a, a, a stronger approach for us meeting our housing goals over the coming eight years. Great. Thank you. Well, that's exciting. I'm feeling a bit old. This is my second housing element, but uh, <laughs> I was there at the end of the general plan too, John. Uh, good, so we got to pause. I forgot to do oral communications. It's kind of dumb, but this is the time for anyone in the public to talk to us about an item that's not on the agenda if they would like to. Seeing none, we can move on to the informational item.
I, I, I don't have a presentation for that. Um, we just covered it. Yeah, yeah. Would, would you like to talk about it a bit still? I'm happy. Um, I think what I understand of it, I cool. Uh, Great. But yeah, I mean, I think the, the main point we, we really hit on in the previous presentation is that, uh, you know, in, in 2022, which, which that annual progress report touched on, uh, we had not yet met all of our arena targets. Uh, we were just missing that very low income category. Uh, the report did speak to the likelihood of hitting that soon. And we've now hit that as of last week. Uh, one of, you know, one of 6% or so of communities in the, the whole state. Yeah. And, you know, even of that, not many of those have the amount of this cycle arena units that we have. So it, yeah. it's especially impressive, I think. Um, yeah, hopefully something we continue going forward in the, the sixth cycle. And, you know, with that too, one, one exciting thing on that as well is the fact that we've now hit our, our uh, this cycle targets as of uh, July 1st, we can start counting uh, units this year actually towards our next cycle, even though our cycle thing doesn't yes. officially start in, even until, until certification in December. We can start counting uh, those units already. So it, the state gives you a buffer if, if you uh, achieve that. Mm -hmm. cool. that. That's especially helpful. All, all the units that we're now going to be approving later this year uh, can still get counted towards your next And in addition, that makes us exempt from SB 35 from the time we meet our RENA until mid-cycle? Yep. So the, yep, the, the next four years, uh, starting January 1st, we would be exempt from SB 35. And at that point, there would be another, uh, even though the state reviews those annual progress reports annually, uh, it actually only looks at that SB 35 calculation every four years. So at, at that point, they would make that determination, and, and it's prorated. So after four years, if, if we've met over half of all of those arena targets that we that we showed, um, then we would be exempt again. And, and there's different triggers. Uh, there's there's two pieces to that. One is if we're if we're not meeting our above moderate, um, then SB 35 would kick in if a project uh, only met our inclusionary requirement. But if, if, say, we've met our above moderate income, but we haven't yet met our low or very low, then uh, SB 35 would kick in 50% affordable projects, such as uh, Eagle Ridge. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. As it should. Thank you. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Um, so with that, we're at the end of the meeting. We don't have any subcommittees going or advisory body oral reports nor items referred to future agendas. Uh, Lee, do you want to just take a quick look at schedule or tell us, give us a general update on things? Sure, happy to. Um, so the next, uh, I mentioned the housing element going to the council at this meeting on the 25th. Um, we also have um, the second reading of the parking considerations uh, associated with AB 2097 um, that the uh, planning commission heard a month and a half or so ago. Um, and then we also have the 530 Front Street project that the commission heard um, also about a month ago um, is going to the council um, this coming Tuesday on the 25th. Um, the planning commission also provided feedback on the Coral Street uh, visioning report and that is headed to the following council meeting on um, May 9th. Um, looking at uh, the Planning Commission's upcoming schedule. Um, we have the um, state mandated uh, Planning Commission uh, review and determination of general plan consistency for our capital improvement program. Um, that is annually something that you all see and comment on. Um, that is currently targeted for the first meeting in May, um, and that's May, May the 4th. Um, that's currently the only item that we have on that agenda. It is uh, dependent upon um, getting through various other subcommittees, transportation and public works and parks and recreation and so forth. So we'll keep you appraised if that, if that pushes out. We don't currently have an item scheduled for the um, second meeting in May, which would be the 18th. 
So we'll keep you appraised if um, that uh, if there is something that's targeting that meeting. But right now, we don't have anything targeted for that. Okay. Like typically this time of year, we email you all our vacations and stuff for summer. Do you want that information? I'm happy or to to wait? take that. We okay. can also it, yeah. If you do it here, but if you've got, <laughs> got it. if you if you've got conflicts um, and you're going to be out of town for any of the meetings, that is helpful. If we understand there isn't going to be a quorum for a meeting, so that if we're you know, noticing and preparing and leading up to that, we can move things around, um, either have a special meeting or push something out if it's not time sensitive. Just to accommodate the applicants and make sure things are going fast. Yep. I want to approve a lot more units this year, you guys. Come on. Just a test. Sounds good. All right, with that, I will adjourn this meeting. Thanks, everybody. What a nice night. Thank you all. Thank you very Thank much. You very much. <laughs> Great work. I, I'm blown away. It's awesome.